Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar tonight. We're going to hear all about how to attract butterflies to our gardens and to our open spaces, to our green spaces here in Finchley and in North London in general. Uh, we're very lucky to have the chair of uh, Hertz and Middlesex Butterfly Conservation, Malcolm Hall. Um, and this webinar is part of our spring and summer initiative called, I hope you already know, Buzz Stops 2024. Uh, I see Dina here and she's the one who conceived this very cute pun, uh, which I hope ma made you smile. Um, we Every year we have two initiatives, one in the autumn called Buzzy Bulbs and Meadows um, and one in spring and summer. Um, part of the initiative, uh, we actually have three things going on. We have webinars and, and Malcolm is starting us off. Um, we then have um, the whole idea where we pay Finchley residents to try and grow flowers from seeds. We give you the seeds for free, the soil, the trays, everything you need. We also pay you a pound and a half for every plant you grow for us. And then we take these flowers and we donate them to the local community spaces. So webinars and pay to grow. The third initiative that we have is the Buzzy Streets Competitions. That is going to launch next month. Uh, we want Finchley residents to add lots of flowers, uh, pollinator-friendly flowers, of course, to their front gardens and to their balconies. And we're gonna have a great competition. We're gonna have great prizes, including things like community hampers with cakes and drinks and a lot of treats for neighbors to share. Um, so all of that is coming, uh, but we are going to start with a really wonderful topic of butterflies. Who doesn't love butterflies? Not only are they beautiful, elegant and graceful, they are such fantastic pollinators. Um, so Malcolm, over to you. Thank you so much um, for coming and talking to us this evening. Great, thanks. Well, um, certainly didn't have to come very far. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, well, nice to... Um, Nice to see a few of you and um, trying to think how you can uh, get to see me um, <laughs> and just me. But um, let's um, maybe maybe if you if the other if you others that have got your cameras on, maybe if you turn take them off, then then um, we can just have me on the screen. Um, so, yeah, that seems to be working. Um, good. All right. Well, um, yeah, I'm here to. Um, to really give you a few tips about um, butterflies and how to um, how to how to go about attracting them to your garden. Um, what I need to do first of all is to see if I can move the slide on, which I can't. <laughs> there we go. It's, uh, it's uh, slow reactions. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm from Butterfly Conservation, which is um, a small charity. Um, based in, in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Um, our aims are quite simple. We want to, to save butterflies, moths, and our environment. That's, that's actually our slogan. Um, and the way we go about that is to try and, um, first of all, record what butterflies there still are around, um, where they live, how, how common they are, and then try and think of ways that we can we can we can address the places they live in to to try and halt the declines which have been quite catastrophic over the last 40 50 60 years um stop more species going extinct and that hopefully fingers crossed try and start reversing some of the the reductions so we've been going as a charity since the since the 1960s i think probably in the first two or three decades we had about 10 percent of the uk species did go extinct um luckily there's been no further going extinct in the last um last 25 years and we've actually successfully managed to bring back at least two of the species that had died out so we are we are making progress uh, I suppose inevitably a lot of um, a lot of the work we've been doing has been focused on the rarer species, and so we've we've been concentrating on them. But I think we we're now finding that the declines in butterflies are so enormous over the whole whole of the country that we're we're re we're refocusing our efforts, not giving up on rare species, but also to spending much more time 
looking at garden species and common species, um, trying to stop declines there. And to, to try and do that, we really need to reach out to everybody. Um, yeah, we've got about 40,000 members ourselves, um, but we've got lots more supporters um, and we work very closely um, with groups that are friends, groups of parks um, or landowners and managers of all sorts to try and um, get um, get it better better habitats for for butterflies. So yeah, increase increase in urban locations um, and re really trying to reach all sections of the community as well, rather than just old retired men like me, which perhaps form our traditional supporters. We we we've now got a lot of. Um, lot more young people um, and people from all sorts of diverse backgrounds that are taking part in our campaign. So butterflies and moths, I suppose I should say, um, why, why do we focus on them? Um, I mean, they are very important as indicator species that when, when you've got, when you see declines in butterflies, actually it's a sign that probably most, most insects are going going badly and butterflies in this country are, are only a very tiny fraction of the number of insect species but they are probably the most noticeable beautiful and visible ones and they, they've always been well recorded so they're easy they're easy to spot and record so they tend to be tend to be an indicator of uh, habitat quality generally and for that reason the the government's put a lot of funding into butterfly monitoring schemes and funding some of our um, land recreation projects so that we can, by 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 doing good things for butterflies, we also turn out we're doing good things not only for moths but for also for for many other insect species. And of course, if things are good for insects, then they're good for all the other creatures like birds and bats and spiders that uh, that that feed on butterflies and their caterpillars. Um, so they're really you know the the main role of butterflies in in as as well as doing important things like being a pollinator is that they're they're often a food stuff for uh, other other wildlife so i've got a few um links that are down here as we go through but what i'll do don't bother to try and write them down i'll um i'll i'll, I'll send them all so you've got you've got them afterwards if you want to click on and have a look at any of them butterfly conservation our main website um, this is just a little section on on our local branch. We we cover um, North and West London and Hertfordshire. Um, we've got sixteen hundred local members, and again, our main priority is is doing recording. We 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 run recording schemes for butterflies and moths, so we've got a very good idea of the distribution of all the species that there are in in the two counties. Um, we run a, a whole load of free butterfly walks, moth trapping events that are free and open to the public, and I know. Uh, I've been talk, talking with you about possibly um, running a butterfly walk in the summer, one of your local sites, which um, you know, will help help with identification tips and seeing seeing what sort of places they like. Um, we do a lot of site management advice. Um, gar gardens particularly have always been a favourite for mine, but lo lots of advice on wildflower meadow. Um, not you know one of the one of the habitats we've lost nearly all of in, in our area um really 99 of all wildflower meadows have gone um and trying to recreate them is not easy um as you know, soil conditions now are, are, are very unfavorable for wildflowers in a, a lot of places so we we do have um we do have quite a lot of different techniques we use for getting wildflowers to um oops gone too far um let's see if we can get that back yeah, quite a lot of tips for getting um, getting wildflowers established, building butterfly banks, improving the management of hedges and woodlands are also other key things that we do a lot of. We we, we like to plan on big scale. We've got five projects going across our area um, on a landscape scale. And by, by planning things on a landscape scale, we get um, we, we can get good whole networks of little sites for butterflies that just having a few isolated pockets of habitat is not great, but having a whole network of um, sites in one area is really good. Um, and in London, we've got, we're currently running the Big City Butterflies Project, which you may have, may have heard of, which is we've got two staff working full time um, on education and conservation um, in, in, within central London, inner London, um, and that's going that's going really successfully 
I think we've built about 50 wildflower meadows um, on that project in the last um, three years since it's been running. So Wild Spaces is our, is our big initiative. We'll hear a lot about that. Um, so what's a wild space? Well, it's any, any area, big or small, which can be improved for, for butterflies and moths. Um, balconies, patios are, are crucial areas. You can see here we've got um, some patio pots. Um, you know, often people say, oh, I can't, I can't do anything. I haven't got, a, haven't got a big area. But all the things you see here, like lavender, rosemary, and mint um, are all excellent flowers that uh, the, the butterflies will love to feed on. So actually, yeah, the, you can. there's a lot you can do if you've got spots. Gardens have huge possibilities and then community spaces such as parks, allotments, um, road verges. We've been doing a, a massive amount of work on getting more wildflowers on road verges. School grounds is a good one, not, not only for their own their, their own benefit but also by getting school children involved you're training up the next generation of conservationists um churches are excellent sites a lot of a lot of church grounds have um have been left um without sprays and fertilizers for long long periods of time so they are they are very good sites for um lots of butterflies and moths so we, we, what we're trying to do is to, to sort of transform these spaces through simple actions that um, that will help butterflies and moths. And we've got a we've got a website here. Let's create wild spaces, which is uh, an excellent site for full of loads and loads of information uh, on everything that you conceivably want to know about how to how to go about it. And again, I'll send you a I'll send a link to that um, later. Won't try and show it to you live now. Okay, um, so moving on to the more of the detail of it, the, the gardening for butterflies and moths. The first thing people often think of is flowers, but that's actually wrong. Um, the most essential thing, the thing you really need to think about to get butterflies in your area are the, the right plants for the caterpillars to feed on. Now, the reason I say that is that most butterflies and quite a lot of moths are pretty fussy about what their caterpillars will eat. In fact, most, most butterfly and moth species will only eat one or possibly two different species of plants. So if and not, not all of those plants are that common. So if you've got the right caterpillar food plants in your area, then Often the butterflies are extremely adept at finding those plants. They can, they've got a very well developed sense of smell and can often detect them from quite a long way away. So if you've got um if you've got the right caterpillar food plants, then you're well on the way to getting um, the butterflies that you want. Um Clearly, flowers are really important as well, and and again, it has to be the right sort of flowers. Um, the 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 butterflies and moths are not not as anywhere near as fussy about which flowers they'll go on. They'll go on, probably go on a, a much wider range of flowers, but they definitely have favourites, and the favoured ones tend to be the more natural and wilder flowers that that we get. Uh, if you think of a, a cottage garden, for example, an old fashioned cottage that have things like lavender for example and single dahlias and daisies in those those are the sort of plants they like but thing things that we have um produced that um you know, particularly plant a lot of plants that are, are brought in from abroad aren't necessarily good because the native butterflies don't know and understand them um also things like uh more complex dahlias or complex roses uh, where we should be bred to make huge, attractive flowers that we like the look of. Um, they're great for us, but they're useless for um, a, a lot of the, the butterflies and other insects because they, they just don't have good, good quality nectar anymore. They've been bred for other things. So flower, flowers is quite, uh, quite an important thing. And as, as we go through, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of the flowers that they like. Um, cutting the grass is... Um, <laughs> generally not a good thing we like to let the grass grow the reason for that's twofold there's a lot of a lot of the grasses and the wildflowers that will grow in 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 amongst them are 
both larval food plants and uh, nectar sources. So they are they are very good for the butterflies left uncut. Um, usually when we are managing um, grasslands for butterflies, there is a cut tape done often at the end of the year with the risings removed. Uh, the reason for that is simply to, to prevent little trees and scrub getting established in the grass and to, by removing the risings, it stops fertility building up in the soil and fertility is, is, is the enemy of wildflowers. So we try and get rid of it as much as we possibly can. Um, sunshine and shelter are, are both really important for butterflies. They, they love sunshine, um, but a lot of butterflies yeah, they won't do well in a shady garden um, under the tree. They want to be in a sunny spot, but they like to be not too far from trees and bushes as somewhere to somewhere to hide. Um, you know, a lot of butterflies are heavily predated by bird species, for example, um, and their ideal situation is sitting sitting in in the sunshine on some flowers, but just just near a bush or a hedge where they can go and hide in if a bird comes along. Do nothing for nature. Um, don't take that literally, but it was the name of a, a campaign we ran um, recently. And that the thinking behind that was really don't do much over the winter months. Um, you know, you don't see butterflies or caterpillars much in the winter. And that's not because the species aren't there. Um, it's because they're going through the winter in as pupae or eggs or in hibernation. And all these all these different stages, they need to be somewhere and they're in your garden. And often if you do go around and clear away dead leaves or cut down stems of, of plants, um, then you'll be removing the very places that the, the butterflies are hiding away so, and, and, and it won't be good for the population. So le leaving, not doing very much in your garden over winter is a, is a, is a good thing. And doing, you know, if you have got to do hedge pruning or things to, to, to wait and do it at another time of year. Herbicide, pesticide and light pollution, these are all nasty things that are, are very bad for, um, for butterflies and moths. Well, light pollution is bad for, for moths. That's one, one of the major causes of moth decline is too much artificial light, which disorientates them. But the um, the, the weed killers and the pest, pest sprays in the garden are, are dreadful for, for butterflies. And the, the best thing is to cut right down on them, lose them all together if you can. Um, and, um, oops, where do we go? Yeah, networks of habitats. Well, I've, uh, yeah, green corridor. I've talked to that. That's one of the one of the things that we do do try and do a lot of to join places up together. So there's lots of places the butterflies can can live close together and helps them move through the countryside. And last, but by no means least, is it, when you're thinking about gardening, is find out for, uh, uh, you know is something you should really do right at the start is find out what species there are in your area and which butterflies and moths you want to, to manage the garden for, because as I've said, different butterflies will like different sorts of plants. Um, luckily for you, we've already done that research, and I can I can tell you that in um, in Finchley, or, or certainly within the Borough of Barnet, there are currently 30 different butterfly species that are resident or common migrants, ones that we see each year. Um, you know, some of those are quite specialists that you'd find just on the tops of special types of trees. Um, but it, it, in your garden, in your area, there should be uh, about 22 species which you should be able to attract um, with the right sort of plants. And most of the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through you and tell you what they are and what they need. So first one, brimstone. This is um, uh, a, a yellow coloured butterfly, or at least the male is. Um, whereas the female is um, a very lemony yellow, almost white. And so the male and female are different colours here. The, the yellow colour is quite similar to the colour of butter. And it's thought that that's actually where the name butterfly comes from, because this is the first species that's out every year. They overwinter as adults. And that we've seen that we've had several flying already, um, even though it's only February still. Um, but because they're adults, they, they come out um, uh, the first on the first warm day um and seen flying around now they're they are 
dependent entirely on two plants as their caterpillar food plant. We've got alder buckthorn here, which is an inconspicuous hedge plant. Um, and there's another one, purging buckthorn, buckthorn, which is closely related, and also another inconspicuous hedge plant. So if you've got those two plants in your garden, no, I'm pretty much guarantee you will get brimstones coming in. I put some in my garden um, about 20 years ago, and pretty much every year since then, I've had brimstones coming in, egg laying on them. And they don't, the plants don't need to be very big for the butterflies to, to lay them. The caterpillars don't cause much damage to the plants. They're, they're pretty, pretty small holes. But if if you want, if you want this one of our most beautiful colored butterflies in, then then one of those two shrubs is essential. They're very good on, you know, when, when we give advice to allotments and parks and things that have got hedges in, they're, they're exactly the sort of shrubs that go very well in that, but they can easily, easily do well in a garden also. Small copper, um, a, a butterfly that you, you definitely see in your area, but is is not particularly um, common or ever seen in very very big numbers. It's um, it's food plants uh, of the dock family, either common dock or common sheep sorrel, which are all very similar plants. And it, it's typ typically a, a butterfly of, of rough rough grassland, um, but will will come into gardens and to to to, to nectar and flowers. And of course, you can you can if you've got docks or you, in my garden, I planted sorrel, um, and it has it has bred on both docks and sorrel at different times. Of course, the, the one of the great advantages of having bre breeding butterflies in your garden is that you get to see them when they're very newly newly hatched out, when butterflies just look so beautiful and fresh. This one particularly is a sort of metallic coppery color, which this photo doesn't really do justice to. Um, and, but it looks absolutely stunning when it freshly hatched out. So if if they if they if they've, if they've grown up in your garden, you'll see them at their very best. Um, large skipper. Um, this is a classic sort of woodland edge species. So you won't see it out in the middle of the meadow, but you will see it on on grass or flowers if if you're alongside a wood or a hedge. Um, very pretty little butterfly, and it 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 has a Two, two types of grass that it lays its eggs on, which are you know are both quite quite widespread common grasses, but you can which which you can include in a, a mixture in in your lawn if you let it grow long. Small and Essex skippers. These are two species. I've only pictured one here as they as they look almost identical. Um, they're quite hard to tell apart. Um, and again, it's a it's grass grass long grass is what what you need. Not really good at twiddling my knob here. But, um, orange tips. These are a classic spring butterfly. They they they're usually around in April and May. Um, it's the male which has the um, the orange tips to its wings, uh, which give the species its name. Whereas the female, it's the one above, um, is white with just black tips. Um, now the again they they these have. Um, very specific food plants, garlic mustard, which are or hedge garlic, um, I've pictured here is something that grows quite prolifically alongside hedges as a wild flower. <laughs> but I, I also grow it in my garden, as I've got a fairly wild sort of garden. Um, and it, it it's it self seeds, so you get you get um, get it coming back year after year. If you don't want something which um some people might unkindly characterize as a weed growing in your garden, then there are there are more standard um, garden plants, particularly honesty or sweet rocket. Both of those are very, you know, close relations, but ones ones which the orange tip will use to lay its caterpillars on. And of course, this is um, not a, it's not only a caterpillar food plant. It's also a nectar source because you often you often see the uh, the orange tips feeding on the nectar from the from the flowers. In fact, for, particularly for the females, it's quite common for them to spend all their time in and around the, these, these plants hiding often out of sight um, while the males patrol up and down hunting for the females. Green vein white, um, one of uh, 
the first of our fully white butterflies, one that won't eat your cabbages. Um, it's it's different from the the more common white species because it's got this distinctive pattern of sort of black veins on the underwing, which is the way to tell it apart. Um, and again, that used garlic mustard, so the same same food plant as as the orange tip. Large white. This is um, probably the most common white, the one you you'll you'll see a lot of in your garden. It's also the largest one. And this one actually is quite devastating to caterpillar to cabbages because it will it will it will lay um, a lot of eggs. It lays in you know a, a lot of butterflies will only lay eggs singly. This one lays in groups of up to a hundred or more. Um, so you can imagine when when they all they all hatch out and the caterpillars have got to an inch, inch long that they they make fairly short work of. Um, even a decent sized cabbage. So you, using nets is a good thing if you if you want to have the, some cabbages for yourself, but leaving some out in out, out for the butterflies is also a good idea. Or alternatively, you can try planting nasturtiums because much as the, the, these butterflies love cabbages, they also really, really love nasturtiums. And then often if you put nasturtiums out in your garden in a and a sunny position and the cabbage is slightly in the shade, you'll find that the, the, the large whites will lay on the lay on the nasturtiums and not so much on the cabbages. So it's a, a natural way you can uh, try and manage things in your garden to um, so you, you get food um, and so do the butterflies. And nasturtiums are another another plant that does incredibly well in a pot. Um, in fact, they seem, seem to do better often in pots than they do do in the ground. So if you if you've only got a balcony or a window box nasturtiums is probably the the number one plant to plant if you want to get some caterpillars small whites are a close relation to the to the large white um much the same comment supply um although this one only lays it lays its eggs uh singly so although there can be a lot of caterpillars they're not usually as devastating to cabbages as the, uh, the large white Brown Argus. This is um, a less common one. It's quite an interesting butterfly because it, it it didn't used to be in um, North London at all until about ten or fifteen years ago. It's one of the species which has benefited quite a lot from climate warming. Um, you know, as 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 the temperatures have got warmer, um, it the, this butterfly has managed to adapt. So whereas it, it historically it only used a plant called common rock rose as its food plant now it's adapted um, and it's able to lay eggs on a, a number of the cranes bill species which are the, the wild wild um, wild geraniums um, and because it it, it, it it can breed successfully there in 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 the slightly warmer warmer years so because it can now use these plants it's actually spread a lot um, and it's become not common but um but quite widespread across uh, the whole of our whole of our area and definitely one that you can get in finchley common blue um doesn't really live up to its name it's definitely blue but it's no longer that common um this this is a, this is a male. The female actually looks more more like the uh, the brown argus um, that we saw before, as they're two closely related species. Um, but this this is a butterfly of um, unimproved scrubby um, grasslands. Um, one of one of the habitats which has largely uh, disappeared. Um, it's completely dependent on um, bird's foot trefoil, which is this. Um, the plant pictured here on the right, uh, sometime known as bacon and eggs, uh, but it's 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 the sole caterpillar. Well, not entirely the sole caterpillar. There's another another var variety called Great Birds for trefoil. It also uses, but nearly the sole variety. Um, so if you if you've got if you if there's one plant that you want to plant in your garden, then I would definitely think Birds for trefoil is a good one because not only is it the the larval food plant for the the common blue, which is a fantastic butterfly, but also it's a good nectar source for a lot of other butterflies. So you will find quite a lot of other species nectaring on the flowers. Holly blue, um, this is actually the most common the most common blue um, in gardens. Um, you know, it, it seems to have become a real real urban specialist. It's it has two two food plants that it, it uses, which is holly and ivy. Um, and it lays its eggs on on the flower buds just before the 
um, the buds hatch out. So in the, it has two generations in the spring. It will it will lay its eggs on holly flower buds, and in the autumn it will lay its eggs on ivy flower buds. Um, and it overwinters in the ivy as a as a hibernating caterpillar. Um, so it, ha having having ivy and not cutting it all in the uh, in the autumn is a is a very good thing for this uh, this butterfly. But it's a it's a it's a beautiful beautiful little butterfly. And if, if you do see a blue butterfly in your garden, it, it's most likely it will be this. It could be a common blue, but particularly if, particularly if it's flying up round bushes, um, it's likely to be a holly blue. Whereas the common blues more often down in the grass. White letter hair streak. This is a bit of a um, bit of a change because this is actually a pretty rare butterfly nationally. Um, but one which actually does surprisingly well in um, North London. It's dependent on two species of plants called elm and witch elm, um, both of which are trees that have effectively died out because of um, something called Dutch elm disease, which attacked them from the 1970s onwards. Um, and they're now quite quite rare to see to see a, an elm tree or a witch elm tree of any sort. Um, but the butterflies are still around and, and they've managed that because the although the tree, the tree, the upper parts of the tree are killed by the disease, the roots aren't. Um, and they throw up new suckers, um, which themselves tend to catch the disease once they've got to about 20 feet high. But there are sufficient surviving suckers um, that, that the butterflies managed to, to 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 adapt to living on them, that it's still it's still hanging on in um in, in some areas uh, and North London seems seems to be one of one of one of its best areas I, I've, I've seen quite a few at different sites in the borough of Barnet over over the last year or two uh, it's a super butterfly and we we manage for it nowadays by um, planting what we call disease resistant elms these these are varieties of elm that have come out come from often Asia um, where they, they've managed to develop um, resistance to Dutch elm disease, which our, our native elms don't have. Um, it's, it's a difficult difficult butterfly to, to see as it spends most of its time sitting on top of trees, but does occasionally come down to thistles or, or brambles, which are both excellent nectar sources to have. Comma. Um, this is uh, very noticeable because of its raggedy wings. You can see particularly here on, on the right, you know, it looks like it's been pecked a bit, but actually this is its natural shape and it's it's doing that to dis disguise itself as a leaf. So when it's got its wings closed, it looks like a dead leaf. And it actually, it actually hibernates as an adult over winter by hiding itself away, it, usually in amongst um, dead oak leaves. So if you think what a dead oak leaf looks like, it's not at all dissimilar to, to the outside of this butterfly. Um, this one, um, caterpillars feed on stinging nettles, so don't necessarily recommend you plant loads of those in your garden, particularly if you've got children. But if you can, um, if your neighbour, if your neighbour leaves their gardens untended and it's got lots of stinging nettles in, and you've got all the flowers, then you'll 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 be able to see the butterflies without having to experience the pain of getting stung. Two more species that are both. Um, both their caterpillars feed on long, long grass. Um, the gatekeeper, which is the one on the left and the meadow brown on the right. Um, the gatekeepers have usually got more orange. Um, meadow browns can be all pretty much almost completely brown if uh, for the males. So they're not, uh, they're not particularly some of their most conspicuous butterflies but they are very very common and widespread and they're some of the easiest ones to get in get into your garden gatekeepers particularly love marjoram so if you've got um if you plant some some wild marjoram or oregano in your but in your garden you, you you've got a very good chance of attracting gatekeepers and you also get mint moth which is one of the beautiful little day flying day flying moths that there's also breeds on them um, breeds on that species plant Peacocks are an iconic butterfly. It's, it's got great big eye spots there, which is it uses to um, to scare off um, scare off predators. Um, 
again it's over winters in, a, in, a, in as an adult this one this one will hide in sheds um and and and, and around buildings in, in dark places um if you disturb it <laughs> it will open its it open its open its wings and flash its eye spots which is pretty scary on its own but even worse it can uh, it can it makes a hissing sound which it does by expelling air from a little pouch in its body so i that, i have a load hibernate each year in my um my shed outside my back door and i have in the past disturbed disturbed them and been been hissed at and it is hor horrifically uh, realistic bit like having a, a, a little owl in there because of course you can't see what it actually is but you just see the eye spots and hear the noise so it, if I was a mouse it would scare me away for sure um the um this is another one that uses stinging nettles as its caterpillar food plants um so really stinging nettles alongside grass are, are one of the the really really important things to encourage um for your butterflies um they can be a bit fussy about the stinging nettles they like to to lay it on large patches that are in the sun um and often they lay lay their eggs quite near the middle um i guess because that makes that's the most difficult places for other other animals to get into the stinging nettles give natural protection from um some, some predators but it is, uh, yeah, it's a, lo a lovely butterfly. And again, very widespread and common in your area. So you should be able to attract it as it is particularly doing well at present. More nettle feeders, the Red Admiral, um, which we get every year. And it used to be um, a mi just a migrant species that flew flew in from, um, from France. But uh, in, in uh, with climate warming, it started to to manage to overwinter in here. It doesn't quite hibernate in the same way as some of the other butterflies. So it it, it does sort of rest up on cold days, but it, it comes out much more readily. So it's almost always the first butterfly that we get reported in, uh, in the year in January. Uh, and often they're still seen flying in December as well. So it's a, it, it really likes warm spots in London. On a, on a cold day, some of the best places you can see them at Oxford Street or near Heathrow Airport, which are the the, sense, the, the two twin peaks of the London heat island. Small tortoiseshell is um, quite a sad story. It's one of our most beautiful butterflies, but it also has also been rapidly declining. Um, and we're not entirely sure why this is, but uh, it's probably due to due to climate change making breeding more difficult um in in london it's um it, it's still doing well in other parts of the country particularly further north um but it's certainly been on a massive decline um down here i used I, again it's another one i get <laughs> the hibernates in my shed um and it used to but 10 years ago i'd often get 30 or 40 and this year i think i've got four so it gives you an idea as to how how badly it's doing in terms of numbers. Painted lady is another one that uh, flies in from abroad each year, and this one this one can't overwinter. Um, it uh, but it can it can breed here. The, the individuals that fly in in the spring can breed successfully in their offspring. Um, fly around and then incredibly it does migrate back again um, in in the autumn. Which wasn't wasn't understood until recently, but it 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 does it does fly back further south, and often often it will start its um start its life cycle again from south of the Sahara, um and fly up, fly across the Sahara, breed in North Africa, then offspring breed probably in France or Spain before it gets up to to UK. So it it's a butterfly that were well, the species can travel many thousands of miles over the, over the course of a year um but that's that's over you know of, often four generations it the, is food plant for the caterpillars are are um thistles they can use nettles but it, it prefers um common thistles creeping thistles which are pretty common plants so actually it does do really well in some years if if there's a big migration in then often you get huge numbers in the in the summer and again one that you can expect to see in your garden speck of wood um this is a a, a butterfly that uh 
lie again it is a woodland woodland loving butterfly so oft, often found along um along hedges and slightly shady areas um breeds on grass so long grass is a uh, and a hedge is what you need to get this one it's pretty widespread in our area purple hair streak is purple on the inside which you can't see in this shot um <laughs> this is uh it to, to get purple hair streaks you need a mature oak tree probably 60 or 80 feet high at least so not something you can easily cater for in your garden but if you've got an oak tree then quite likely you will see purple hair streak it's not um it's not very conspicuous but it is as, as the adults spend most of their lives on top of the tree um but if you use binoculars and look at the right time which is often sort of eight o'clock in the evening as the sun's going down in the middle of july um you'll see a surprising number of these little butterflies dancing around on top of the tree two more grass species the the ringlet on the left uh, and the marble white um these have both been spreading actually and uh, in into uh, into london neither neither was at all common 20 years ago um but because of I think partly climate warming, maybe also people leaving more grass uncut, um, but also at long term, a reduction in um, pollution uh, as a result of coal burning um, going down from the 1950s onwards. Um, you know, th there are more butterflies around now in London. It's, it's one of the few areas of the country where butterflies have actually been increasing. I'm pleased to hear. Don't forget moths. Um, <laughs> moths are more complicated, um, mostly because they're much harder to spot as they, the vast majority of them fly at, at night, although, although there are a number of day flying moths. Um, also, there's a hell of a lot more species to deal with. Um, probably on in the country as a whole, I think we've got 60 butterfly species, but two and a half thousand moth species. And locally, I've said you can expect 22 butterflies in your garden. There's a, there's over a thousand moth, different moth species being recorded in um in, in Barnet. So they they are much more complicated to manage for, and actually we 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 know a lot less about the requirements of a lot of a lot of the moths. Although there are um you know there's there's quite a lot of plants that that we do include when we're giving management advice that are suitable for moths. Monitoring them is, is is more tricky. I mean, we usually do it through the means of light traps, um, which attracts the moths. It doesn't kill them, although I suspect it probably doesn't do them a lot of good because they get caught in a trap and bashed around a fair bit. Um, so although we do do moth trapping, we don't, don't do it to excess um, to avoid damaging the populations. Um, and moths as a whole, there are so many of them that practically any any native plant in your garden will will be a food plant for some moth moth or other. So good a good mix of native plants is uh, is probably the, the easiest uh, easiest advice of managing for moths. Um, and I put here a few nectar sources: Budlia, which also is the number one moth nectar source for butterflies. But if you go out, if you've got a Budlia, you see butterflies on it in the day. If you go out with a torch in the evening then you'll probably see quite a lot of moths on it as well. Nicotina, the tobacco plant, um, that's again is, is one that flower, flowers at night and it does that because it's purposely trying to attract moths, uh, as is evening primrose, which is a, a I grow a lot of in my garden and that's a fantastic plant for, for attracting moths. So there's a plug for butterfly conservation. Um, the thing things we try and get people to do um creating a wild space in your own garden or park um if you if you if you go onto our wild spaces website and register register on it then you you will receive um a lot of information on tips on butterfly gardening and things you can do it's a, it's an excellent website that we've created quite recently and again i'll i'll send the link around afterwards um 
but yeah we have we have our other branch and national websites and we've got lots of um social media um so you mentioned the youtube channel but we we do twitter and facebook and all, all the other things instagram as well so there's always lots and lots of information about butterflies i mean if you if you want to keep in touch with what's flying probably our our, our branch website, Hearts and Middlesex Butterfly Conservation website, is the is the best place to to go for um, for finding out what watch butterflies are actually on the wing at any one time. Um, we always want more records. We can never have enough records. This is our annual report, which we publish each year, which has got detailed um, maps of where all the species have been found in, in Hearts and Middlesex. Um, nowadays, a lot of the recording we get is done through the iRecord Butterflies app, which you can have on your phone. It's really easy to use. If you if you want to record a butterfly, you turn the app on. It will it will come up with the species that are you know it will help you identify them. But it, the the ones that come up top of the list are the ones that are most likely to be flying in that area at that time. So it does really make make my identification very easy and also it gives us a great source of records and um you know it, after it you know, we didn't have this app five years ago but now it's uh we get most of our records coming this way we of course we've also got the big butterfly count which you you may have heard of which we do each year in um late july and early august um i think last year we had over a hundred thousand people across the country reporting in butterflies it's a big like a bit like the big garden bird watch but it goes on for three weeks and we ask people to do a 15 minute count either in their in their garden or local park or or anywhere you choose really and just tell us which which of the butterfly species you 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 see and, and again that's that's proving some really useful data for us to um help inform our, our conservation activities um so yeah, come along to one of our free guided butterfly walks. As I say, hopefully Siri and I are going to manage to arrange a date um, for a walk in Finchley this summer, which would be great to see um, as many of you um, as can make it. Um, and also feel free to introduce us to um, to anyone you know that might like some advice on uh, on getting more butterflies on their sites. We um, yeah we do we do 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 a lot of. Uh, a lot of lot of advice for different landowners and managers um and um yeah generally quite successful in getting getting more butterflies right my voice is giving out so i think i must be over time shiri's appeared that's a, probably also another indication <laughs> <laughs> shall i stop no, no i mean if you have uh, more content uh please do share don't not on my account no, i guess i just I, wanted uh, to yeah no i i think that was the, i got a one or two other slides. This is just about our big city butterflies project I mentioned in um, in London. But um, yeah, I think that's probably enough. I'll stop sharing and uh, very open to any um, questions. Um, first of all, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. First of all, I think at least from my side, I can say it's it's exactly what we were hoping to to get um, some practical advice on on how to attract butterflies and this sort of idea of uh, focusing on how to feed the, the, the caterpillar, the caterpillars and then the, the, the butterflies will come naturally uh, because you're actually growing them in your own garden. I think it's even more charming uh, than, than simply um, fe feeding the, the, the butterfly themselves. So it's, mm -hmm. it really did uh, cl click for me. Uh, but also it was really great to hear that there's so much that we can grow in pots uh, because not not everyone has um, the the garden space, um, and so so that's really encouraging as well. Um, and thank you also for doing the research into specifically which butterflies already um, have some population in North London, in Finchley, in Barnet, um, so we can focus on them and and not necessarily waste our efforts on some sort of exotic. Uh, other species that that will not necessarily yeah. come even if we really try hard. So so that's really. Was really helpful as well. Um, I I think we we definitely have um, a, a time for questions. So so we've uh, designed the webinar to leave at least ten or fifteen minutes for questions. So um, if you if you you can raise your hand and in or or I don't see many raised hands at all. Um, or if you if you're a bit shy, you can ask something in the chat and and we can have a look like that. Uh, we can check. 
um, or if you just want to say a comment um, or ask a question about a project, now is now is a good time. Do we have any? Well, that's a good sign in terms uh, of. Okay, I see Dina. Go ahead, Dina. So first, unmute yourself. I think Dina, you are still on mute as far as oh, I can. Yeah. Well, Good. I okay. That just, this is the catchphrase of every Zoom meeting, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and Dina, uh, I work with Shiri on the Colonnado project, and and I I so appreciate um, being a recipient of what's clearly your vast knowledge. I think what the, what what struck me is, um, you know, you were saying that what makes significant difference in, in stopping this catastrophic decline is to have large landscape uh, sized areas to yeah. plant and large numbers of, of butterfly and more importantly, larval uh, friendly plants. I mean, is aside from assuaging our own consciences, is there a purpose to putting some marjoram and oregano and, and and lavender in three pots on a balcony will that make any kind of significant difference to one or two butterflies well it will in, in itself it's obviously a very small thing but it's mm -hmm. um yeah it can it can make a make it make a add something for um add something for individual butterflies for sure so, so in terms of, um, I'm quite ignorant actually about about life cycles and and habits of butterflies. But what is their, um, what is the what is the distance that they cover each day when when foraging? Well, it, I mean, the, the, there's lots of different species, and and mm. you'll get a lot of different answers depending on on which species you are, and also what you know. As I said, some of them migrate literally thousands of miles, mm. Mm. Um, and so they could be they could be in one place at breakfast, and uh, some somewhere the other the other end of the country by um by by tea time. You know, mm -hmm. other 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 butterflies and moths will literally still be on the same plant they were at breakfast time so okay. it's quite it's quite 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 difficult to give a general answer but other than saying it, it it's it's highly variable but i i would say the vast majority will will move around but they you know they do move a lot and they move because to to, to avoid getting eaten by birds i think basically so they do they do move around they you know they're looking for mates a lot of the time so you know males will often patrol up and down the same area so you'll see them going up and that and then down again and they, the, the male male butterflies often mark out, effectively mark out their own territory which may, you know, might be 100 yards long a long hedge but you'll get if you if you stay there you'll see butterflies going past off it's the same one that's going up uh, and it, okay. sometimes it will get to the other end it will find an, an, the next male and they'll have a little clash and then both go back on on their sections of the hedge so they are they are they're, te they're territorial and they but they you know those ones will will keep 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 going on their territory but then if they want when they want to go to sleep for the night they might fly off and get into a wood half a mile away and be be in be in the tops of the trees so they'll they'll look they'll look for the resources in the landscape, but generally right. they won't they won't go on on super long journeys unless it's a migration, um, mm -hmm. or yeah, or sometimes a colony will build up and it's there aren't enough resources locally, and that's when they they disperse. So they can go on longer flights then, but I, I would say generally most of them stick within you know half a mile or so of where, right. where they are okay. some of the tidy ones might stick within the much shorter areas and some of the most mobile ones will will go halfway across the planet <laughs> okay thank you so much that's fascinating um thank you thank you for an excellent question dina as well um we have uh, uh matt with the raised hand so matt do you want to ask us a question um hi all well, it's actually hillary and matt joining from east finchley thank you for your talk malcolm 
Um, I just wanted to pick up, you mentioned your um, very exciting, uh, full sounding shed with all the hibernating butterflies in. Um, is yes. there anything we could do to encourage like space <clears throat> them to hibernate when, rather than just the caterpillar? Um, it's quite, it's quite, it's a really interesting question. Um, it's one that I've been trying to do a bit of research on as well, because it's, um, it's not really well understood why they hibernate in some places. I think, <laughs> and it's not the same for all species. I mean, that my my shed gets peacocks and small tortoise shells and herald moths that hibernate as adults over the winter, and I think they're all looking for the same thing, which is something that's dark and cool with a constant temperature. Um, the, the the shed they use here is actually part of my house, and it's 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 marked on the original house plan as the cellar. I think it's been designed to be a bit like a cellar. So it's got very strong brick walls. There's very little light in it, but it does keep a, a very constant temperature. Uh, and I think that's what attracts the, the butterflies. Um, they, they're very, um, you know, other species though, that like comma, brimstone, never see them in there at all. They're obviously looking for something completely different. Um, but yeah, those, those, two, those two species do seem particularly attracted by uh, domestic buildings. I mean, sometimes you get them coming into rooms in your house, um, and that can be problematic because they they need cool temperatures over winter to hibernate successfully. So often we get reports of people that when the central heating comes on, they suddenly have a butterfly behind in the window uh, flapping away because it's woken up thinking it's spring, um, and then you have to. You know, uh, let it out or or if you if you've got a cool place that isn't heated transfer it there um but yeah i i think if if i was going to design one i would i would i would make it solid you know an outbuilding an outbuilding is a is a constant thing in in the wild um a cave in, in the rocks might be a good place um one one of the one of the um places that they're they're quite often reported is an old second world war um gun box which is made of really solid concrete and it's got a tiny little slit in it needs us it needs an entrance slit to get so the butterfly can get in and out but it doesn't want much light so it wants a really tiny sort of window basically with no glass in it so <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's their right that's their ideal thing but i mean you can oft, often we get you know people say oh well i've got one in the porch or i can see one sort of underneath the gutter you know they'll hide in dark little little crook nooks and crannies one, one of the things they must watch out for is is predators so they often spend a lot of time flying around really really slowly looking for hibernation spots before they go in because it's basically a life or death decision for them um so it it can be it, it, it yeah if they if they if they go somewhere and, and spiders are in there they can get eaten by spiders or or sometimes they get people send me photographs of um where they've been eaten by bats which can absolutely just you know you can get a hundred peacocks all chewed to bits by bats <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh it's uh, yeah they they, they it's a it, th th there's quite a lot of things they're looking for so they want they want something that's solid constant temperature small gaps not large gaps quite dark um not straightforward <laughs> thank you thank you thank you thank you for an ex another excellent question um in the chat we had uh, janice asking about where to buy um these kind of plants um so i think we'll we'll ask malcolm from for his recommendations later I'm happy to say that a lot of the plants that were mentioned are uh, we bought the seeds um, and and we are getting Finchley residents to grow these for us. Um, so so Dina here has done a wonderful job in 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 thinking about all the different requirements and buying seeds. But of course, we, we you know, we we might come come uh, and, and buy some more based on this talk if we need to. Uh, but but we will ask Malcolm for some recommendations of offer to to buy maybe the grown plants in case, uh, you know, it's difficult to grow from seed. Uh, and we will share uh, these recommendations along with the slides that Malcolm, Malcolm ma mentioned and the recording. Um, and we do have a YouTube channel where you will be able to find a recording of this webinar. Uh, in a few days, just give me a few days uh, time. It's, it's usually quite, quite a quick turnaround. 
Um, so let me quickly check if there are any other raised hands. I think we're quite quite on time. Any last comment or from, from anyone? Um, if not, then I'll just um, thank Malcolm again. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, clearly, they're based on so many observations and research. Um, so we can't thank everyone, but we know a lot of people were involved in gathering the data um, that that allow um, you know these kind of discussions and and us making more informed decisions about what to grow uh, and where to and where to grow them, where to locate them. That that sunny sunny um, positions and things like that was another uh, helpful information. So. Thank you very, very much, everyone. And we hope to see you. We hope you get involved with our project as well. So see yeah, you well, I hope, I hope we can find a date to do a walk in the summer. And uh, it's really impressive what you're doing. It's uh, it's great, great to see. I'm really happy. Thank to, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I, I know exactly who I'm trying to convince uh, in, in Finchley, which open space. I can't share it yet, uh, but it's a lovely open space. And I think the, the reason we haven't uh, finalized the date yet is that they might not know from now until July, but I, I I will apply some some gentle pressure so we can we can get it booked in. It will absolutely be a, a wonderful experience, I think, for for us in Finchley, and we really appreciate you offering to do this for us. Yeah, we'll see if you can arrange some nice sunny weather as well for the day. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to I be honest, in July, even 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 on cloudy days, we still yeah, if the temperatures sort of more than seventeen degrees, you still see butterflies flying. So the weather, you know, even even there, there's some butterflies that will fly even in the rain. Okay, I guess I can I can tell the people here we're still here is that we are thinking about um, long lane pasture. Um, so in any case, we 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 truly uh, recommend visiting Long Lane Pasture. Uh, during the summer, it has so many different butterflies, uh, but we are trying to arrange and organize an identification walk uh, with Malcolm, um, and 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 so more more uh, to come. We we hope to manage to organize that. Thank you so much, everyone. Have uh, a great you. evening. Thank wonderful. you for joining us this evening. Yeah. Good to see you all. Bye. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.